Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Aneta and I'm part of the event team at Forms the Library. I acknowledge that wherever we are in Australia, we stand on the traditional land of Aboriginal people. I recognize the traditional custodians of these lands and the continuing connection to land, culture, community and story, and pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. Here at Hornsby, we are on the lands of the Daug and Gaingai peoples, and I invite you to recognize the custodians of the country you are on. Our workshop this afternoon is Emergency Preparedness, and we are pleased to have Liz Cater joining us from the Australian Red Cross. Emergencies don't just include major natural disasters like bushfires, earthquakes or floods. A fall in a home that results in an unexpected hospital stay, a car accident or serious illness can also cause significant disruption and add stress to your life. You can reduce the impact of emergencies, big and small, by being prepared. Welcome, Liz. Thank you, Anita. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the um, direct people of the Gango country. Um, I'm actually based in Blacktown today, so welcome everyone. We are going to talk about the Red Cross Ready Plan um, program. Um, what I'd like to ask you is if you do have any questions to maybe just save them up till the end of this session or we do have the chat box on zoom if you want to put your questions in the chat box we can address them at the end of this session thank you so to start with i think i might just give you a little video hopefully i can get it to work don't realise until everything's gone how much photos mean and the memories that they hold. My knitting books, my sewing patterns and my materials I've collected for years, all gone. So I did lose a lot of recipes that my mother and grandmother had had. Every day you think of something and some of them bring you to tears. I'm not a person that, that cries, but I did have a little tear in the eye there a couple of times thinking, I have no idea what to do. What I find the most interesting about that particular video is that it's not the house and the furniture or those kind of things that you miss. It's all those small things that you think about maybe after. But like Anita said, not every emergency is a flood or a bushfire and destroys your home. It could be an accident at home or like we've just going through, it's the whole COVID thing. That in a lot of ways is also an emergency. So we just need to be aware. So what does it mean to be prepared. So the household disaster preparedness is this actions and the knowledge and skills that you have to reduce the impacts of a disaster. Imagine that you're at home, and this is just a little thinking about thing. You're at home in the evening, it's early evening, and you've got some kids at school, the children are doing their homework, the dog and the cat are outside and you're cooking. And a sudden storm whips up. It's dark, there's thunder and lightning. The children are doing their homework, you're getting the meal ready. Suddenly the electricity goes off and you hear a massive crack. A tree near your house has been struck by lightning and is on fire. What do you do? you do nothing I think oh yeah well the tree will burn out but if you do have to leave because the trees might maybe damage the house and the storm is so bad what do you take how do you get hold of your animals that are outside during the storm how do you keep them safe how are the children reacting how do you contact your partner who may be still at work would it not be a whole lot easier if you knew beforehand 
what you would need to do if you had to evacuate. Now you have managed to get everything together and everybody together in the car. The car is parked inside your garage and you suddenly can't open your garage door because the electric door opener doesn't work. Do you actually know how to manually open your garage door? They're the kind of things that are all twirling around in your, in your head and how much easier it would be to react and to act if you have thought about these things and if you are prepared about these things. I'll just leave that one with you for now. First things first, think about what it means to you, how to prepare your mind. Know that whatever happens, it's going to be stressful. Identify how you might react and how you might feel during an emergency. People have different ways of reacting. You know yourself best. Identify how you would react. And once you've done that, try to manage yourself, manage your, your reactions. Think positive, think, okay, I know what I need to do. I'm prepared, I know what I need to do. Breathe calmly, slow down your breathing and do some positive self-talk. Those kind of things seem quite small, but they help enormously. So first of all, think about it and don't do that just for yourself. Do it for the people that are with you in your own home, your family, your children. What are the benefits of being prepared and being psychological prepared? You're much more confident. You feel much more in control. And by being better in, more in control, it enhances your ability to cope with any kind of thing that might happen. The other thing is you'll make much, much better decisions. You'll grab the right things. You'll know what to take instead of running around like a headless chook at the end, trying to work out what it is you might need to take. And once you do know what you do need to take and you have a basic kit ready, it's much, much quicker to get ready and to evacuate. So all those things will really help to calm you down and to be better prepared. So like the Royal Fire Service and the State Emergency service we also have four steps four steps to help you to be better prepared in here i've got a little audio which i'd like you to carefully listen to and at the same time think about what you might need to do if this happens in your life the time is 12 p.m eastern standard time this is your emergency broadcaster abc radio with a weather warning for the east coast from the bureau of meteorology a gale force wind warning has been issued and is in effect until at least tomorrow gale force winds of 80 to 100 kilometers per hour are expected to batter the coast causing widespread damage within the next few days 42 millimeters of rain is expected to lash the coast later this afternoon and tonight and lasting up to 24 hours while this weather is extremely serious and very damaging, this station has been advised there will be no emergency evacuation centre activated and you will need to rely on your own personal emergency plans. Currently, there is a low pressure system which is extending across the New South Wales North Coast. There is a deep trough which will move away from the coast during Tuesday and Wednesday as the high pressure system strengthens the ridge over the Northern Ridges region. A cold front is then expected to cross the state during Thursday and Friday. The State Emergency Service is advising people to immediately activate their personal emergency plan. Secure or put away loose items around your property. Move vehicles under cover or away from trees. Secure your pets safely. Keep clear of fallen power lines and find a safe place to shelter. The next weather warning update from the Bureau of Meteorology is due at 4pm. If you hear, hear somebody like that in your local news, what would you be thinking? What do you think you might need to do? What preparations? At this point in time, they say, you don't have to leave your home yet, but get ready. What would you think? The last thing he says is, the next update will be at 4 p.m. 
have you listened to that? Have you heard it? Or are you just going to go and keep going and do nothing? Is doing nothing a real option? For most of it, it often is. But at the end of the day, I think, start to think about it. So this next slide is really about the types of emergencies that we might have, and particularly here in Australia. Natural emergencies, the bushfires, floods, earthquakes, storms, heat waves. Did you know that heat waves actually kill more people than bushfires and storms put together? Heat waves are what we call a silent killer particularly with people who have underlying health issues, heat waves can be really, really dangerous. And it is well worth considering that and bearing that in mind. We also have other things like accidents. And as Anita said, that might just be an accident in your own home. Somebody in your, in your family who falls out of a tree or who has an accident and suddenly needs to be taken to hospital. Things like chemical skill, spills, explosions, we've had acts of terror, like we've had the, um, the mountain place siege a few years ago, and infectious disease. Well, right now we've all learned about an infectious disease and what's happening and the kind of things that we might need to do and how we need to adapt. So think about the kind of things that are likely to happen in your area. Sources of information, and it may be that you're already well aware of these. The Bureau of Meteorology is a really, really good source of information. A lot of us have the weather app on our, um, on our phones and our uh, tablets, really useful. Live traffic, terrifically useful. But also, don't let's forget the local council website. If you need information about what might happen in your local area and what support a local council can and will give you during and after an emergency, their website, they have information um, during an emergency and floods about road closures, etc. Really, really relevant and useful. In Sydney, our local radio, the emergency radio is ABC Sydney at 7.02 a.m. If you're ever traveling, try to um, tune into the local A um, ABC radio for that particular area, because ABC are the ones who are the designated emergency um, information service. Obviously TV and internet, as long as we've got electricity, but don't forget the really, really important role that a community plays. So your neighbors, I always, ah, oh, my banner is falling off. What a pity. Um, really important are your neighbors. For instance, if your electricity suddenly goes out and your house is blacked out in, of an evening, apart from going to have a look to see if, um, if your own um, mains have switched off, what do you do? You walk outside and you go and have a look. And the neighbors are also walking out because they've got the same thing to say, have we all got a, a general um, electricity blackout or is it just something that's happened in my house? So neighbors know each other. If you're fairly new to an area, the neighbors who live there for a long time, they might know what sort of issues there are, which, which is the best road out if a road is blocked and those kind of things. Those communities are incredibly important. The other thing these days is helpful apps and Facebook sites. There are so many useful apps now that we really would um, recommend. They're all listed here, so I won't list them all again, but I will mention a couple of them. Certainly I would recommend the Red Cross Get Prepared app to put on, but also the Emergency Plus app. The Emergency Plus app is a terrific little thing, and you can see on the top right-hand side the, a, a picture of it. Um, it actually gives you a direct telephone link to both the triple um, zero, but also to the SES and the police. But it also, on the Emergency apps, if you look at the bottom, gives your exact um, geolocation of where you are. And one of the things that where it helps is if you ever out somewhere in the country, you're not quite sure where you are, your car breaks down and you're trying to ring the NRMA and you say, 
I don't know where I am. I'm somewhere near Dungog, but I really don't know. Your Emergency Plus app will tell you the exact geolocation of where you are. And it also will tell, say so at the bottom of the app, what three words. They will tell the emergency services people or the NRMA, whoever else needs to come and help exactly where you are. So you've got that on hand and with you at all times. Obviously, there is another app that's useful, My Hazards app. Brazilians New South Wales has got a really good Facebook site now. And again, your local council. But I would like to make a cautionary um, warning here. Facebook's book has some really uh, good, reliable sources. And I particularly would say the, the local RFS Facebook site, um, site is really good. But beware of unverified information and unknown sources. So if you look at Facebook and it's about a bushfire and you get people posting things about, oh, you can get this or you can get that or you can go here or there, don't necessarily rely on that, but rely on the official information that you can get from any of these trusted apps. And be, like I said, beware of all those rumors that can fly around Facebook and, and Twitter and WhatsApp, um, just as a warning. Okay. So that is that was step one get to find out what um, you need to know before something happens. The second step is about getting connected. It is really important because the people who help most when an emergency happens, whether you're evacuated or whether you have a bad storm, whether your house is damaged, whether um, the kids can't go to school, those kind of things, your immediate and most important support is your own family and also your extended family, your friends, your neighbors, your local community, local support services and council. One of the things that I've found when I was talking um, in, the, in the last year, I, I made a lot of phone calls to people who were affected by the bushfires um, that happened at the beginning of last year. And so many people who said to me, look, I had to leave my house, my house is destroyed, but luckily I was able to stay with friends or parents, or, you know, my parents had a caravan at the back of their property and I'm staying there now while my house is being rebuilt. Um, on the day when it happened, I didn't have to go to the evacuation center. I was lucky enough to be able to go somewhere that I could go. And then you have that immediate support rather than be in, in such a strange environment that an evacuation um, center can be. They're fantastic. We have to, we need them. But if you can go to somewhere that's a bit more familiar, it's always preferable. Ways of meeting people in the community. You go to the shops, there are community meetings, festivals. It might be that you're putting out the bin and your neighbors are putting out their bins as well and you have a chat with them. Um, one of the things that I did during ANZAC last year, we did in my street during ANZAC um, services last year, we couldn't go to the services and everybody went outside in the morning at six o'clock. And in fact, a couple of girls, young girls in my neighborhood, um, played on their flute and clarinet the last post and another neighbor quoted the the um the ode and it was beautiful the whole community came together but it might also just be picking your children up from school and having a chat with the parents that are there it's a great way of getting connected you can get to know your neighbors um i know an, another lady who I spoke to just last week, she lives in, a, an, in an apartment block and she actually simply put an, a little note in her neighbor's letterboxes to say, I'm so-and-so and she's from a, a, a Pakistani community. And she realized that there were a lot of people from um, the Asian communities in the flats. Um, and she put little notes out. If you want to make contact with me, or if you want to have a chat, I speak your language. I'll be able to help you. It was a great way and that way the community comes together. But also be aware of other people in your neighborhood who might need help. 
you might have a young mother with with children and animals who doesn't have a car you might offer help for them or you might have somebody in the neighborhood who has difficulty getting about walks with a walking stick or even um, relies on a, um, a wheelchair be aware of that and offer help offer support it, most of the time you don't need to you do not need to be in each other's pockets but it is good to be aware of each other and like maybe exchange phone numbers in case something happens. Strong communities generally are resilient communities and resilient communities in an emergency tend to be far better prepared, they react better and they recover much quicker. And I think those three things that be prepared, be better reacting and recovering more quickly is really, really important. It reduces the trauma of any event. Step three, get organized. So think about what you will do in an emergency. Most importantly, talk about it with your family and other support people. Write it down, don't just have it in your head and haven't, don't have just discuss it, but write it down. And once you've written it down, keep a copy of it on your phone, on your computer, on the, in the cloud, in a, on a USB, whatever you want, but always have a backup. So think about if an emergency happens and you have to evacuate, where will you go? Where might you meet up? It may be that, you know, if you're all at work and one of them, you have to leave home and you can't go home, within your family, you might already have discussed, well, if I can't go home, I'll go to mom and dad's place. That's where we can meet. That's, it might be a little bit away. Think about what you might, will take and we'll have a little activity about that a little bit later. And think about how you might get there. What roads might be close? Have, just think about those things beforehand. Because if you know, again, if you know how you can go to a place, you won't get stuck. You know, is there a road that might get flooded? Well, you know, you better not go, go through there if it's a really bad rainstorm. Is there another way out of your area? Here's a little video. I just had an incident at work and I just absolutely lost it. And I said to my manager, I said, oh, I'm not coping. I'm not the person I was before this. It was a really hot day. It was just dry and horrible. Um, so we were just sitting inside watching TV and uh, we noticed a, a message being scrolled from CFS down the bottom of the screen about a, a bushfire at Samson Flat. And you sort of get into that mindset of, oh, what happens to other people? It won't happen to me. We evacuated on Friday night, got through Saturday. Um, halfway through Sunday morning, my husband managed to get back in. And I remember driving up and just seeing the landscape like it was just barren. Everything you looked at was black. We were lucky we didn't lose any sheds or the house, but we lost all of our fences, most of our retaining walls. Every spare minute we had, we were out chopping up wood, trying to put everything back the way it was before the fires, and you just exhaust yourself. I'm luckier than most people, and yet I'm not the person I was before this. I think it was because we weren't prepared, so we didn't have a plan, so we, we didn't know what we were in for. Not having that plan left us wide open to a whole heap of unknowns that we, even months after, we sort of didn't realise the impact of. It's the impact that an emergency can happen. And like this lady says, the biggest impact is they weren't prepared. And if they had been prepared, she would have been far better able to cope with the results of what happened. So in an emergency, think about how you would leave your home and what you would need to do before you leave your home. Think about what place you might meet and where is a safe place that you can go and stay outside of your home and where you can meet up with the rest of your family. This last little bit, do you lock your doors and windows at night is a particular hobby horse of mine really um 
I've got a back door that has a, a deadlock on it. And I never used to keep a key because I thought, oh, no, it's all right. You know, don't need, don't use the door very much. Don't need to keep a key on it. And then I realized that if something happened and for some reason I wouldn't be able to get out of my front door, I would need to use the back door to get out of my house. And what if I couldn't find the key for that door? So now I've found a place near that back door. Not, I don't keep the key in the back door because I don't think that's necessarily safe, but I have a place near the back door where everybody in my family knows that's where I keep that spare key for that back door. So they're the kind of little things that if you've thought about it beforehand, you feel much more reassured and much calmer to be able to deal with, um, with an emergency. We are fortunate these days because we can save so much on our phone, on a cloud and in the USB. So what do you take? You know, we used to recommend people to have a box with all their special and precious papers and those important things that you need. That's a big box. Your photo albums, those kind of things, they're big boxes. These days, what you really need is a record of them. So have a copy of your passport, have a copy safely saved with a password in your phone or in, on your computer and laptop, a copy of your Medicare cards, a copy of your bank statements, or make sure that you can ex access your bank details, copy of your driver's license in case you leave home and you, you brought nothing with you. Um, with photos, I'd say if you can, scan them scan those precious photo albums and in fact what i also suggest to some people is if you have things like mementos in the first video we saw mum's recipes um things like special furniture that maybe is passed down the family or that beautiful tea set that your grandma gave to you and you you think you might not be able to take that put it out Take some photos of it. So even if they get lost, at least you've got a memory, a record of it on a photo. Keep that somewhere safe. So you keep all of it on your phone. Fine, you can do that, but at least also have a backup. Keep it in the cloud. Or I've got at home um, a, a, um, a hard drive backup. And every now and again, I, I back things up and I make sure I can grab that. Or better still, leave a copy of that with somebody you you trust and know. Or well, the cloud is fantastic as well. We've got all these options to do it, do it and do it now, rather than waiting till the last minute. The other thing that I would suggest is writing down, let me have a look, I think that's the next slide. Yeah, write down important names and phone numbers. And again, most people will have those in your phone. What happens if you've either left your home without your phone or your phone's run out of battery? So also have a backup of that, please. Your doctor, your GP, the kids' school, the local police office, who to call, those people that you call in an emergency or where you might stay. Copy of your neighbors, but also things like, um, and you might've taken a photo of it, um, what medications you take or even a, um, a, photo, a photo, a copy of your prescriptions. So if you've had to leave without any of your medication, you know where it is and, what you, and that you can get those medications again. So again, write it down and save that information. Um, one of my colleagues suggests also make sure that you put your home phone number or your contact phone number, your mobile number, on a piece of paper or a card in your kid's school bag so that if something happened they'll be able to contact you whoever picks it up they'll be able to contact you so get packing and i've almost talked myself out of having to pack a box of things but i still suggest that you do pack either a box it could be a wheelie box it could be an old backpack you have or an old suitcase. Keep that somewhere where everyone in the family knows that your kit is. And it's reasonably near the door, the exit of the house and not in the back of your wardrobe on top of the third shelf. 
keep it somewhere where it's handy and accessible. But it doesn't have to be anything fancy. The only thing that I will suggest is if you do pack a box or something, stick on top of it a list with the last time you checked that box, which is important. You need to go back to that, that kit once a year at the, at the very least, maybe when you change your smoke alarm batteries with last minute things to, to do. So the last minute things that says, grab your mobile, don't forget your keys, lock your windows and doors, turn off your electricity and gas, and make sure the cooker is off. So those kind of things, those last minute things that you need to grab, really important. So get packing and here are, here's another little activity that I would like all of you to do. If you have a pen and a piece of paper, I'm going to play you the next audio, which goes for about a minute and a half, telling you the instructions of what to do next. You're listening to the ABC radio, that's what you hear. But at the same time, while you're listening to that, I would also like you to write down, say about eight or 10 things that you need, you absolutely need to take. And if you like to, if you don't want to write it down, you can put them in the chat box, the kind of things that you do need to take. But also at the end, I'll ask you a question of what was said in that audio. So you've got a minute and a half to write down the things you need to take and listen to the instructions. The time is 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is your emergency broadcaster, ABC Radio, with an updated weather warning for the East Coast from the Bureau of Meteorology. This afternoon has seen wind strengthen across the East Coast of New South Wales and the Southern Ranges and is now expected to remain strong to gale force through to Saturday. The Bureau of Meteorology has issued a severe storm warning with dangerous thunderstorms, potentially large hailstones and damaging winds expected to hit eastern New South Wales within the hour. Gales are expected to be even stronger offshore with a warning that 5 to 6 metre swells will rapidly build along the New South Wales coast over the next 24 hours, with king tides expected along the east coast. The State Emergency Service reminds you to stay away from the beach areas, do not drive anywhere unless it is essential. Check livetraffic.com.au for road closures. Do not drive across flooded roads, bridges and causeways under any circumstances. Obey any directions given by emergency service personnel. Keep clear of fallen power lines. Avoid using the phone during the storm. Turn off any electronic equipment. For emergency help in floods and storms, ring the State Emergency Service, New South Wales and ACT on 132 500. That's 132 500. So, how did you go? Did you manage to make a list? Did you also hear what they said about using your mobile phone? Do you remember what they said was the number for the SES? Did you hear what they said about where to go and where not to go? Or did you concentrate on what you need to grab when you're running around the house? Would it not have been better if you knew what you needed to get or if you already had that pretty much organized? so that you could listen to the instructions and follow them. And by that time, by the, end, by the end of the one and a half minutes, you probably already would have got everything out into the car. What happens if you, at that point in time, remember that four hours earlier, we were told about this storm and our animals were outside. What would you've done with the animals? Are they still outside? They're gonna be very scared. This is the kind of thing that I, I would like you to really have a think about and, and think about how you would react. You know, your heart rate's probably up in the hundreds by now. So what do we need in our kits? A kit is something that's fairly individual, but there are a couple of, a few things that are pretty standard, I would say. 
water and maybe some food. A can that doesn't need a can opener and anything that doesn't really need cooking and that doesn't perish. You can put that in your kit. If you have a spare pair of glasses, put them in there so you don't forget them. Toiletries, a small first aid kit, the phone with the charger, that's what I put in my, I would put in my last minute list and obviously also my wallet that goes on the last minute list. Medication, probably also on the last minute list. Pack some good clothes, some long trousers, long sleeved shirt, a warm little blanket maybe, and also something to do. It might be a pack of cards, it might be a favorite book or so, just so that if you're ever caught out and you need to hang around, wait in an evacuation center, you've got something to do. You can add your own things to that. Don't make it too difficult, but those toiletries, you will, you will miss them, I'll tell you now, if you don't have your own toiletries with you. Um, wet wipes, these days, face masks and hand sanitizer. Put them in your kit as well and have them. I probably would have some of those in my car anyway. Next one, kit for adult, for children. What I would recommend is that you get children involved in making, in putting their own kit together. Have a practice with your children about putting a kit together. They need to take some of the usual things, some food, some drink, if they have medications and toiletries, yes. But you also would like to put in something special for the children, something, yeah, the kind of thing that they normally take to bed with them, really important. But what I would recommend is you get the children involved in preparing for that. Practice with your kids, give them their own bag and give them their own instructions to do that. And I say that for a couple of reasons. For starters, it'll give them a responsibility and something to do which will help to keep them calmer because they know what they need to do. And secondly, it'll get them out of your way and not make it even more difficult for you to get your own things ready. So that, and that responsibility, children really take that on. They love doing it. So get it and practice with your children. Don't leave it till the last minute or when you think, do it before the bushfire season, do it and make it a routine. And, you know, maybe once every few months or so, or that once or twice a year that you actually go and check out your own kid, get the children to check out their kid and to and make sure that you update it because not all children are at this, you know, different stages, they need different things. Kids, the next kid is a kid for your pets. Because like I said, once that storm hits, and it's dark and it's noisy and it's windy. Your dog's under the car and your cat's up a tree. So if you wait till then, it's really a bit too late to secure your animals. So when you know that we have bad weather coming on or something that's going to be a bit tricky and that's going to be stressful for you, because remember, your animals will pick up your stress, secure your animals, make sure they're in the house and that. And then you get your kit the favorite blanket, some dog poo bags, always take the lead and collar, and also make sure that you have on that an identity tag. If you have a basket to keep your cat in, make sure that you have the cat's name and your contact telephone number on a sticker on the outside. Obviously some food um, and, and drink, maybe a toy the vaccination certificate. But the other thing that's really important when you talk about animals is practice with them. If you have a cat that you never put in a cat basket and that's never been in a car, it's not going to react very well when you suddenly have to evacuate. And it's not very difficult to practice with them. Even if your, your vet is only a couple of, a block down the road, you can walk over there with your cat in your arms put them in a basket, put them in the car, have a practice. And it's the same with the dog, not just walking on the lead, which they need to do, and some dogs aren't used to that, but also for a dog to get in the car and be driven somewhere. Have a practice with them. Do that and make sure that if bad weather or a bad situation occurs, that you secure them well before while you still can. 
Now, the last couple of slides before we can go to Q&A is a couple of bits. This Get Prepared app that I already mentioned, you can get that, download that from the App Store and you can find more information about any of the resources um, that we, we have on the Red Cross website. Just go into Red Cross website and emergencies and resources. So you can download that one. The other one, the next one that I was going, that I've already mentioned is this Emergency Plus app. And I think absolutely, without a doubt, make sure you have that downloaded on your phone. Um, and when you could phone us with you, absolutely terrific. And that, this last one, is a card that you can actually also download from the Red Cross website. It's a Hey Neighbor card. And it's basically a card that you can put in there to say, this is my name. This I live next door or at number 10 or whatever. Um, and tell them that there's some things that you can help them with maybe. Um, if you're on holidays, I'll be able to collect your mail for you and keep it safe. And I'll bet your bottom dollar, because it's happened to me and I've tried it, is you'll get a, a, a phone back or a, a text message back to say, thank you for your card. This is my phone number and happy to help with whatever you need. So really, really helpful. That is the end of this presentation. So I'm really happy now to check and see. Anita, do you want to go in and maybe do some of the Q&A stuff? Uh, yes, yes. Let me just turn my uh, my camera on because um, I had issues earlier. Just bear with me. I can see you. It's on, I think. You can. Oh, wonderful. You can see me, but I can't see myself. That is fine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, such an important presentation. Um, I've written down so many tips, and um, the first thing I'll do is create an emergency kit. Very, very important. Yes. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A. Now, the question is um, from John. It says, Liz, what do you suggest for those who do not use a mobile, who are not online? Um, if you have, have the possibility to copy all those things, do you have some a trusted person that you know, and it's particularly with older people quite often, um, if you have a, a trusted pe person that you know, um, get them to help you with it and save some of your important documents. Um, but then, of course, obviously, you have your kit, you can do those things. And also, write all these things down. Um, on the Red Cross um, website, and uh, you can actually probably from a Red Cross office, pick up the actual booklet, which is called the Ready Plan booklet, Protect What Matters Most, that booklet. Um, if, you, if you let us know, we can actually send you a copy out. Um, that in that booklet, you can put all, you can follow those steps in there and write them all down. That booklet was actually prepared for people who do not have, you know, a mobile phone or, or anything like that. So my suggestion is do that for yourself on the booklet. And possibly if you want to save and take pictures or so, talk to a trusted person who does have access to uh, technology. Does that help, Thank John? You so much, um, we do have um, a message from Karen. It says, may I suggest as part of your kit, is a battery backup for your mobile phone? If there is no power, this yeah. would be a great benefit. It is. There, there are, I didn't mention that, but um, we used to talk a lot about a radio. Now, a lot of people have that mobile phone. You can get solar backups for your mobile phone. They also have um, wind up radios, which quite often have a USB port in them. So it's wind up or battery. If you have a battery phone or a battery radio, then always make sure you've got some spare batteries with you. But a lot of, uh, these days, again, we can have um, solar. Uh, and in your car, quite often, you can charge up um, uh, your, your phone. But just make sure that you don't run down the battery in your car, obviously. Does that help? It's very important, yes. 
Yeah, but thanks for the battery. It's really it's important. Very, very important. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're quite easy to get now in, in uh, the hardware stores, etc. Okay. Let me just check to see whether we have any other ones. I'll stop um, sharing this. Okay. Now, um, Joanne um, is thanking you for your answer. Um, and is asking you, can you please give a phone number for people without internet to call for um, Red Cross emergency prepare documents? Um, you can call any of the Red Cross offices. Um, I think the phone number is Sydney. The best number would be 9229 4111. But it's something that Anita might also be able to publish on the, um, on the website, on the library web. Um, to say, and like I said, you can apply, you can ask for us to get one sent out to you. Wonderful. Um, I will forward an email to everyone thanking them, and I also include the number that you just um, mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is an, an uh, email website, news, NSW Emergency Services, NSW Emergency Services at redcross.org.au. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes, quite a few of our attendees um, are thanking you for your rep the presentation. Very, very informative and useful and motivating to get prepared. It's, it's absolutely my pleasure because I'll tell you my experience from working in evacuation centers, etc., is, and, and particularly also in recovery, is that people have been prepared are so much more able to listen. One of the things that happens when you're affected by an emergency is that your brain goes, what I call AWOL, it goes absent without leave. You can't think anymore, you can't think straight. And all that stress just adds to, to our you know, anxiety and it makes it even more difficult. And the better prepared you are, the more you know what to do and therefore it kind of automatically kicks in and you'll be able to deal with things much better. And because of that, you will, um, you, you will recover a lot quicker and a lot better. Yeah, really important. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, Joanne is uh, thanking us for your presentation, um, your present for presenting, and it's um, yeah exploring various emergencies and help actions to put in place before the emergency. Thank you, Lee. Yeah. yeah, and then finally, again, what I'd like to stress is don't do this just for yourself. And I know sometimes it's really difficult to talk about it in a family because it's like the too hard basket and oh I don't want to talk about that now it's scary it it is and it is confronting but it's better that you confront it now rather than when something happens because you'll be much better prepared then so that's correct yes yeah are you my little trauma teddies there you go <laughs> yeah so yes are there any other questions have a look. Um, we haven't got any. Um, let's um, ask everyone if you have any more questions. Uh, this is a time to ask Lee if you could type them in the um, in the Q and A box. It would be great. Now Joanne is asking whether you or someone else talk to community groups. Yes, we do. If you put in a request for us to talk to a community group, um, obviously in the past year, I haven't done too many presentations, but we've actually, um, before last year, we quite often went out to a community group and had a chat about this, um, sometimes with a PowerPoint, sometimes without, we might have brought a kit round. And in fact, what we also try to do is reach out to community groups for who English isn't their first language. So yes, we do. We do absolutely happily talk to community groups. Yep. Okay. Um, if you'd like to ask any more questions, everyone, uh, Liz is uh, happy to answer. Um, okay, Connie is asking whether 
um, a copy of the recording will be available? Yes, definitely. Um, once we finish um, the session, uh, we will, uh, once we finish some editing and add captions, um, we will post it on the um, YouTube uh, Hornsby Council's um, channel. So please stay tuned. I will forward an email uh, thanking everyone, and I will also include the link to the Hornsby Council um, YouTube channel so you'll be able to go on and watch it again and maybe take down those important information that you didn't have time to take down earlier, like me. <laughs> I know there's, there's actually a lot of information and I've only, you know, got limited time to to talk about it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. It'd be nice to have it on the YouTube. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, any more questions, everyone? While we're waiting for maybe another question, I'm going to give you another little example that has nothing to do with major emergencies and evacuations. But just imagine that something has happened in your home and let's say you get a phone call from an elderly parent who's had a fall and the ambulance has come and they've taken them to hospital and you go and run to the, rush to the hospital and your parent, your mom says, can you go home and get me an IT and my tablets and this, that and the other and a few things and you go to their home because the ambulance hasn't been able to find anything to take. And you go to their house and you try to get whatever it is they want. And you come back to the hospital and your, your parent says, that's not what I wanted. That's the wrong thing. You got the wrong thing. That's not the book I was reading. It was another book. What would happen if you had a kid ready? You know, and particularly with an elderly parent, if they have a kid ready, there's maybe a list in there of what medications they're on in a regular you know, on a regular basis. And you had a few things like a nighty and maybe a favorite book or something to do. I'd probably put my knitting in there. Um, they're the kind of things, just those small things make it so much easier if you're prepared. And if you've thought about that, just another Absolutely little- I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't have to be a major big thing. It's all those little things as well that make a huge difference to how things go. And it only takes a few minutes to put together an emergency kit. Absolutely, it doesn't take long. And it's not something that you have to do straight away. You don't have to have everything in it, but you might put a few things together and then a day or so later think, oh, maybe I should put this in here as well and that in here, so yeah. As long as you remember every now and again to check it to make sure that whatever's in there is still relevant. Uh, let me just check again. Okay, uh, no, we haven't. Um, I think it's time to thank you. My pleasure. So we started helpful and informative uh, session. Good, I can't good. thank you enough, um, please. Well, as you can see, I'm really passionate about this because of the experiences that I've had from more than 10 years working in the in emergency services. And I'm just a volunteer, you know, but we, you know, it's what we do. The SES and the RFS, Red Cross, we're all volunteers. And yet once you work in that space, you get so passionate about it. So I'm really, and I'm really happy to share this information and I hope it's been useful for all of you. Thank you. I'm sure everyone, um, yeah, just happy to be here. Let me just have a look. I think one message came through. Yeah, Joanne is thanking you and um, and Hornsby State Council for organising this. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, it was great having you uh, with us this afternoon. And yep. as I said, the recording will be up on the um, Hornsby Council's YouTube Good. channel. Good. And, um, and very uh, happy. Yes. If, if anybody has any other requests, just let emergency services know and I'm sure we'll do our best to accommodate you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for attending this afternoon. Goodbye. Bye.